So, JRuby on Rails in 2009. Um, I'm the third developer and engineer. My name is Nick Seeger. <coughs> and I want to start today by say, asking how many of you have heard of JRuby? You might have heard of it. It's a, it's a <laughs> Ruby implementation <laughs> implemented on top of the Java virtual... Ch whoa, whoa, wait a second here. I guess I don't need that slide at this conference. <laughs> 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 so um, I thought I'd take a step back, uh, sort of like Charlie and Tom did, and kind of ask where we are with, with Rails running on JRuby, and take a look at what, I'll also take a look at where some of the pain points are, some of the things we can improve upon, and what we're able to do well. And take that and kind of paint a picture of where we can move forward. So JRuby on Rails in 2009, where are we? How does, it, how does it go? It works. All right, thanks. <laughs> All right, I suppose I should go on. Um, I'm gonna, I thought, uh, I wasn't planning on this right away, but I thought I'd take a moment and just kind of recap the actual uh, JRuby on Rails experience from a demo standpoint. So I'm just gonna do, go uh, through the basic act of creating a Rails app um, and deploying it on a Java app server, just kind of reset the stage for everybody. So, uh, before I do that, can I ask uh, how many people uh, are deploying JRuby on Rails apps? So, looks like a good third or almost half of the room. So, uh, this won't be new for all of you, but um, it'll at least give you an idea of kind of where we stand. Put this mic down. So uh, just to, I did a little bit of prep, so I'll show you that um, well, the first thing you need to do with when you this is after you install JRuby, you would want to install the gems, including Rails, and there are a couple other gems that you need, um, and I'll just show those that show you that I have those installed. Uh, so you need some JDBC gems, and you need the JRuby, uh, then you need uh, the JRuby gem and Warbler. And I'll be using all these tools a little bit later. So I'll just show you that, that these are in fact installed already. Um, so th they're, they're those. We should create a meta package. Yeah, I'll get to that later. <laughs> um, so you, uh, of course the first step with any Rails app uh, is no different with JRuby. If you've got the Rail, if you've got Rails installed, you just run the gem and you can just create your Rails app that way. <laughs> and so now we've got our Rails app uh, here, as, as you're all familiar. And the next step we would do uh, is a one-time step that you need to use just for JRuby apps where you want to use a database. Uh, you, then the latest Active Record JDBC release, there's a special JDBC generator that inserts a couple of files into your Rails app that lets you use the JDBC connectors better. Can you just keep it at the bottom of the screen? <coughs> just uh, yes, let's cut it off so it's... Let's do it like this. Right, so now, so we've added the JDBC bits in there. Um, and at this point, we can actually do a break db create all. And this is a standard step in Rails where you create the databases that your application will use. Notice that we I created the, the Rails app with just the default settings, so what it actually did was uh, it created uh, three SQLite databases for me, which are, of course, empty now. There's nothing in them. So in order to actually add something to our app, we'll just add a, a scaffold. Uh, we'll just add a person scaffold. We'll just give them a, a, a name field, just so we have something to show that we're storing stuff in the database. And the main point with this so far is, I mean, obviously this is nothing new. Uh, the main point being that up until this point, the, the experience has been identical to the, the normal Rails development experience, ex except for that one little generator step, and, and I'll show you that it, 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 it continues that way. So then we can run rake to migrate the database. Created the people, the people table, and then we can actually should be able to start the server at this point. And I have the Mo I have Moggle installed. Moggle runs fine on JRuby as well as, as probably a uh, few of you know, are aware. So I can go to the people page. And here's the people app and you can go and add people into the app as you would expect. 
and everything's working as expected, so great. Um, you can also notice that you can actually go into the, the console view and that works just fine as well. So the, the IRB console that comes uh, with, with Rails preloaded into it um, works great in JRuby as well. And we can do a person that all, of course, we see the two records we just added. Uh, okay, so the next step, um, we've got an app running, and I want to actually take the app and convert it into a WAR file so that we can deploy it in the app server. Uh, to do this, we need to add a couple additional steps. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change my production database to use my SQL instead of um, uh, SQLite. So let's go down here, my SQL. Now I'll just go, I'll create the, that database. Create. So that database gets created. And in fact, we do, if you look in the MySQL console, we see the JRuby comp database is there. So then we can run DB migrate in production as well. And that works just fine with MySQL. And now uh, one more step we need to do is uh, I'm going to create a war file of the application with Warbler and the one thing I need to do is add some some gems to my environment RB to tell tell Rails that I need those gems, uh, to tell Warbler that I need those gems in my in my work file. So I'll go in here and I'll add a config gem active clicker DC adapter. And I'll add the MySQL driver. And I, then I don't need to, Rails doesn't need to actually load anything, they just need to be present in the gem repository. So the environment is set up. And then I can simply just call the, the warble command that comes with Warbler. And this will do all the work to create a war file of the, of the Rails application. And then all I'm going to do is I have a GlassFish server running in the background. I'll just deploy the war file to GlassFish. That's the GlassFish deploy command. <coughs> Takes a couple seconds. How big is that war file? How big is the war file? The war file is 14 megs. A little hefty, but considering that it's completely self-contained, it's, it's actually a pretty nice, <coughs> nice, pack, uh, nice package. You can take that and drop that into any app server on, on any um, OS that has a Java virtual machine running. So maybe it's not so bad. So the, the war file deployed, then we can actually go to uh, the GlassFish server, which is running on 8080 by default. and the war file get, got deployed with a prefix of jrubyconf. You can go to people, and here's the app running inside of the GlassFish application server. Of course, our database is empty, so we can add people to it again. And everything works just as we expect, same thing. So you can see that um, the main point of this was to show you that even though this is a very simple app, app that I showed, uh, the JRuby on Rails experience <coughs> is very much similar to the, the standard Rails development experience. And um, I don't think there's any reason not to consider using JRuby during your normal daily development, especially if you're targeting a Java environment. Okay. So, uh, quick word about what works with, J with JRuby and Rails or what makes it a really a good, a good choice. Uh, obviously, the JVM is a rock solid virtual machine that, that, does, that does very, very rarely crashes. Uh, the JVM works by, you set a memory limit, an upper limit on the amount of memory the VM can use, 
and when it hits that point, rather than crashing uh, like the like the C Ruby interpreter, it will just tell your application that it doesn't have any more memory, and you'll have to figure out how to deal with it. So this makes makes for running long servers, long running servers, uh, much more make, makes it much more stable, and much much easier to to have trouble free production environments. And of course, the deployment choices aspect of this I just demonstrated, you can run it on any Java application server anywhere. Having those choices is helpful when you run into um, environments that are a little bit more locked down in terms of what kinds of software you can run there. And then uh, we like to say that jRuby on Rails is fast enough. Um, I'll show you some actual numbers in a little bit here. Um, and you'll get an idea of what that means. So what doesn't work? Well. It's not fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's not to say that it's not tolerable. I think it definitely works well. And in fact, I think those of you who are running Jerry Van Rails apps say that it's not a problem usually. But uh, we take performance seriously, or we, and we'd like to think that we could find new optimizations, new ways of running Rails apps, uh, running uh, new new things we can do on the JRuby side of things to make running Rails uh, really zippy. Um, you didn't see this during the demo, and that was sort of on purpose. Though, so the Happy Path <coughs> development works great with JRuby. But then once you start to stray off the path and actually do normal development tasks, like use uh, image processing libraries, use uh, JSON libraries, use typical plugins that you would actually want to use during Rails development, you start to feel some pain because there's a little bit of mismatch in some of those. And I'll, I'll list out what some of those are later. And I'm sure some of you have run, run into a few of those from time to time. Um, that goes uh, as well with incompatible plugins. Some, some people, Rails uh, plugin authors, just don't target JRuby at all. And they may be using a few of the corners of, of the JRuby uh, VM that don't that aren't don't really uh, they are not compatible with with CRuby implementation. And backgrounding, um, forking, and scheduling, and, and running t uh, tasks in the background is an area that uh, frequently get, comes up uh, on the mailing list in the IRC channel. People wonder how the, how to do these things with JRuby. And again, we're limited somewhat by the virtu the Java virtual machine and its inability to give us full control over the operating system uh, process launching. Uh, so there's, there's the, a lot of the backgrounding solutions that you typically run across with Rails apps don't translate over easily to JRuby. So another way to look at how JRuby is doing with Rails is to actually look at the Rails test suite itself. And this is a graph of JRuby running uh, all the Rails tests except for the action, active record is not on this slide. I'll show those to you in a minute. Uh, I have test results for 234 and Edge. And you can see we still do have a few, a few errors, um, there, but there are a few zeros in there as well. So we are running a couple of test suites cleanly. We do have a few issues in active support, a few issues in action pack. And um, there's a, a larger number of, of errors on the action pack edge. There's, there's one bug with some, some HTML escaping that happens with rendering that I haven't just ran into, just noticed the other day and haven't tracked down what the problem is. So that, that should not be I would think within a, uh, you know, a few days of looking at that problem, that number 80 for the action pack on the edge would, would go down significantly. So we're actually doing pretty well with uh, Rails tests, at least on this, this side of the, of the equation. Uh, so then we move on to Active Record JDBC. Of course, this is the, the Active Record adapter that allows you to talk to databases using Java's JDBC interface. And we actually started work on this uh, way back in 2006, about the time we first started running Rails, we started to write a little Ruby, little uh, bits of Ruby code that used JRuby's Java integration to talk to JDBC <coughs> and, and basically write an Active Record shim or an Active Record <coughs> connection adapter that would do the work for you. And we've been uh, basically steadily developing that library ever since. And so uh, here's a look at where it is today. So here are the Active Record JDBC. Here's how Active Record JDBC performs on the Rails unit tests. As Tom mentioned in the, the keynote, uh, MySQL is pretty close, but still not quite clean. We have about 19 to 20 errors. I should say about 15 to 20 errors, depending on which version you run on. Um, Postgres and SQLite uh, go up from there. Uh, surprisingly, uh, the, the existence of these errors is not enough to prevent you actually running Rails. You saw that I ran SQLite with the scaffolding just fine. There, there probably will be some cases where that will bite you. And if you do find those, we'd be happy to hear about them so we can get them fixed. Um, now this is, yeah, so that's, that's the unit tests. Um, I mentioned that, I showed this in the demo, how with the latest release, there's a little JDBC generator that the, the, the process for getting JDBC injected into Rails was 
bit, bit difficult before this and a lot, you know, required much more non-standard workflow. This makes things quite a bit easier. So this is the only step you have to do now. And of course, so as far as what databases we claim to support, this is the, this is the list of open source databases. How many people um, using these databases in their applications? Okay, probably most of you. Um, these are, this is a list of proprietary DBs that we've had patches for at one time or another. I can't claim that any of these are, are you know, near as 100%. And in fact, more than likely, these are probably lagging behind the open source databases. How many people are using one of these databases in their applications? Okay, so a few, quite a few. Um, it's my opinion that we actually, um, you know, the, the target market that we're looking for um, with developing Rails apps is actually going to be people that have shops that use one of these databases. And we, it's, it's a little bit tricky for us that we don't necessarily have unfettered access to those systems and, and have, have the domain knowledge and expertise required to get them running cleanly. So this is an area that hopefully in the future we can find a way to shore up. So as far as pain points with uh, Active Record JDBC, obvious, the, the obvious one is we have to keep up with Active Record. We have to follow Edge. We have to make sure that uh, it runs clean with whatever changes are happening in Active Record. And fortunately, Active Record is pretty stable. So that hasn't been too big of an issue lately, but it certainly has bit us in the past. Um, th there's also the issue of trying to maintain compatibility with multiple versions of Active Record uh, with a single version of Active Record JDBC. And, and our approach for that has m lately been to just punt on the older version. So I think we, I run tests uh, going back to Rails 2.0 Active Record uh, right now when I, run, when I develop Active Record JVC, but even those tests aren't completely clean. So your best bet is to pick the latest version of Rails and the latest version of Active Record JVC. Um, this, uh, the lack of prepared statements, of course, is something that you, you're probably aware of as just a de facto <coughs> issue with the way Active Record is built or, or, or rip coded. And this hurts on JVC quite a bit. We can't necessarily fix this either, um, not easily. And uh, this, this is a common complaint we hear from people, especially on Oracle and some of the other um, big iron databases where prepared statements are really the way, way to um, get, get the extra ounce of performance out of databases. And to, to not use prepared statements is to blow out the query optimizer on those databases, and that's a problem. Um, as far as actually developing with Active Record JDBC, if you want to use your own uh, database that maybe I didn't have on that list before, uh, the, le the learning curve for the code base is a little bit high. It's not clear how to plug it in and how to build a new de adapter for a new kind of database. And of course, there are just too many to keep track of, and we can only support so many, and we need the community to, to, to step in and help out with those. So what I'm hoping for ARJDBC 1.0, which uh, I don't have a time frame in mind for it yet, but I'm hoping probably within the next six months we can move towards a 1.0. Um, which shouldn't be that revolutionary. It should just uh, hopefully contain a, a simplification of the code base, make it easier to understand, uh, easier to, to see where things are laid out so that people can dive in. We want to have a mechanism so that people can declare their, their metadata and their, t their type mappings for their databases ex externally to the actual adapter. So you could have a configuration file of some sort that's in your application that defines those mappings and give the, give the application developers more control because we're just not going to be able to cover all the cases. If somebody's using the, you know, the XML type in an Oracle database or the DB2 database, we're probably not going to uh, have direct support for that in, in built into Active Record JVC. And hopefully, with that simplification and the, that um, <coughs> process of externalizing those those database mappings, we can uh, attract more patches, more committers, and and hopefully attract fewer bug reports as well. So next next item into consider in the retrospective is Warbler. Um, I'm gonna speed up a little bit here. So what works with Warbler, you saw it in action. It, it ma makes building a war of a Rails application a breeze. Um, it's pretty straightforward to configure. In this, in this happy path case, I actually didn't have to do any custom config. I just had to go into the Rails environment and add a couple gems. And uh, what you didn't see under the, underneath there is we've actually recently um, extracted out a separate gem that contains just JRuby itself so that when you when you uh, um, upgrade Warbler, you can upgrade JRuby independently. And, and the actual JRuby jar file that gets put in your war file can be versioned separately. So that's a nice nice addition. Um, what doesn't work is that usually when you, when you build uh, larger apps, you do need to get into configuring things um, ab above and beyond what I showed you. Um, and there's some the, the way that Warbler builds the war files, it actually creates a copy of all the files in your Rails app in a little staging area and uses the, uses the Java jar file to create the actual jar command to create the, the, war, the war file. 
And there's a duplication aspect of that that makes development turnaround difficult. And there's also an issue with Warbler where if you want to, if you have custom break tasks in your application that generate more files to be included in your Rails app, and one example is uh, the, the Asset Packager plugin or similar plugins that uh, do you know minification and compression of your asset of your your Rails assets. It's a little tricky to get those to actually get injected into your application because the way Warbler builds the uh, the WAR file is to do a basically do a scan at at when the rake file is loaded of all the files that need to be included. So you actually if you actually run rake tasks later, it's missed the boat on telling Warbler which files should be put into the to, into the WAR file. So I'd like to try to correct that. Um, so the general idea for the next step of Warbler is to actually combine it with Bundler. And if you don't know about Bundler, that's the new um, gem sort of vendoring utility that Yuhu Katz and Carl Lurch have been working on for Rails 3. And it, it, I've been starting to use it more and more with a lot of my projects, not just, not just Rails apps. And it's a really slick, slick way to just basically build in a little sandbox uh, specific to your one application or your one project and, and make sure that all your gems are isolated to that project. So it, it seems natural that to have Warbler take advantage of Bundler for, for taking care of gems. So what, we, what, what, what do we call this? I don't know, maybe you call it Wunderbar or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Name change is yet to be determined. Maybe it won't be, maybe it won't be any different. But anyway, so the idea is to use Bundler um, and try, you know, maybe uh, get rid of the copying, try to assemble the app in place, um, eliminate the need to use Ruby gems at runtime so that the Rails startup can be a lot faster and try to be smarter, try to um, try to, to make it so that we don't have to do as much configuration even for the for a, a real a real world non-trivial Rails app. Uh, JRuby Rack is, if, if you don't know, it's an actually a little servlet filter library that, that Warbler includes in your app for you, and that's what allows your Rails app to actually be mounted inside a Java app server. Um, I've work, been working on this for about a year and a half now too, and, and the, 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 the general idea of, or the general thought about JRuby Rack is it works, and that's a good thing. And it even works on App Engine, believe it or not. We didn't have to do very much work at all just to get uh, JRuby on Rails apps running directly on App Engine, and JRuby Rack is the library that allows that to happen. Um, it does probably need a little bit more love. Uh, I feel like the code that's there is getting a little heavy for my tastes. Um, I have never really taken the time to really do some heavy optimization on the code, so I'd like to, like to do that. Um, and then there's some other issues with how other servers handle um, Rails apps uh, around whether it can load uh, files from the file system through uh, direct file access or through resources or class, class loader resources. Some, some uh, app, uh, application servers prefer to run war files completely unpacked, so it actually it, things actually stay zipped up and that can cause problems for Rails if there aren't files loose on the file system. Um, we've learned a few things about how Rack works in the process of building JRuby Rack and there's um, some things I'd like to go, go back to the Rack community and, and talk about um, possible changes around lazy loading of the environment hash and other <coughs> things like that where it doesn't seem like it's necessary to, to build up a full rack environment uh, for every single request and we don't need to use all of those values. And then finally, again, the App Engine guys have been communicating with me quite a bit and I've been ignoring them sometimes and I'd like to get back and make sure I can roll back some of those, um, that feedback into the product. So as far as JRuby Rack 1.0, no big plans right now, but hopefully we can continue to improve it. So performance, um, of course, you know the performance has been the big elephant in the room for us with Rails for a while. So if you look at uh, this, is just some simple Active Record benchmarks that we created in the Active Record JWC project. Uh, they're they're nothing fancy. They basically do things like uh, the the labels at the bottom, find all, uh, create uh, model that new that valid. It does these things in a, in a big loop basically and just measures time. So it's not it's not doing anything extensive, but it gives you some idea of of how you know, what, what kind of overhead the database access layers provide. And we show that, it shows you that there is, that Act JDBC is actually pretty competitive for most of these. Um, it, it loses a little bit on, uh, I think, on the, on the right side of things. On the read side, it seems to be pretty competitive. And then if it's still only doing in-memory operations like validation, um, it has no problem, no problems there. And of course, we're probably not really touching the JDBC code at all there, so that's, that's why that, that is the way it is. So, um, but that doesn't mean there, there's a room for improvement, of course. Um, the next part of the equation for Rails is there's this notion of dark matter. We've, um, Ola Feeney has probably tried to 
profile and optimize Rails on JRuby about once every three months or so, or once every quarter. And he always comes back with an email to the core group and says, oh, I ran some new, remember, new numbers, and I have no idea where the time is being spent. <laughs> <laughs> and we've, we've done this repeatedly, and, and maybe it's just a function of Rails itself for that matter, but uh, we like to think that there's something that we can do to crack the nut of, of Rails being um, you know, slower than we'd like, I guess. And so if we look at, uh, this is just a, a graph of a min average, median, and max of, of request latency, and I, I ran these numbers on, on the, the Spree Commerce application, which is you know, a, a decent, non-trivial web app. And when you hit the homepage of Spree, it does product lookups and, and category lookups and things like that, and renders out a, you know, a, a, a product listing page for you. And so it's actually doing some stuff. And you see that JRuby is pretty competitive here. Um, the, the error bars on there is actually the standard deviation, and we show that after JRuby gets a chance to warm up, the standard deviation is actually slower for JRuby than it is, than it is for, for Ruby 186. So that's, that's a generally a good thing, but we'd still like to see the numbers get, you know, get even more aggressive than this. Um, here's a breakout of how the request time is spent approximately between the three uh, components of Rails, and you can see that um, model, uh, the, let's see, the, actually the model stuff is about this. Well, the controllers, hmm. Okay, I, I thought the models and controllers would switch around. So, so what you see here is there's, um, the controller is taking a bit more time than the model here on the JRuby side, of, uh, than, than the controller is taking, a, yeah, <coughs> more time on JRuby than on Ruby 186 here. There's something to dig into there, but there's still the fact that there's this huge swath of rendering, but that's the case for both, uh, both interpreters. So where do we want to go from here with JRuby on Rails? Now that we know where we are, what, what comes next? Of course, standard cliche, cliche is the enterprise. Um, <laughs> but what does that really mean? Um, so I think the first step we need to do is really take, take a, a categorization of all the broken windows we have. And I kind of hinted at some of those so far. Here's a little more concrete listing. So I talked about Active Record JWC, how we've got you know, an ever-increasing number of bugs there. Um, we seem to, seem to be falling behind on. We've got things like the JSON library issue. There's a, there's, a pure J, there's a pure Ruby version of JSON, there's a C extension, and there's a JRuby version, and they all have different names. And there's no, there's no easy way to just make sure you're at, if your app uses JSON, you get the right one. You have to know to install the JRuby version versus the, the, C, the C version. That's, that's a barrier to new, new users. Uh, another one that a few of us have found out who have been doing um, JRuby on Rails development is that the, the pure Ruby memcache client really sucks on JRuby problems with, um, well, just threading and the way sockets are handled, and it, it doesn't perform very well at all. And so um, one of the LinkedIn guys, Ikai, I don't know if you're here, Ikai, but um, uh, he worked on a, a memcache client using a Java memcache library, and that has worked pretty well for the few of us who are actually employing that in pr production Rails apps. Uh, we used it at the, the previous um, project I worked at, it's on Project Kena uses that. And so there are choices like this where it's another case where the, if you're using memcache with JRuby, you really want to use this, but there's no easy way that you would know that that's what you need. And so um, Image Voodoo, I mentioned here, that's the, that's the image processing library that uses the Java 2D to do image processing, and it's, and it's interface compatible with Image, Voodoo, uh, image Science for, for CRuby, but again, it's another one of those things you have to know about. Um, session store choices. So if you're running on a Java app server, we have a, we have a s version of the, ra app, uh, the Rails session store that can be stored, put in the Java servlet session. Uh, but that's not available by default. It's not always the best choice, but it's something that people might find useful, especially if you're integrating with a Java web application. And then of course, we have an open SSL gem, which gets used for a lot of stuff and it's sold separately. It doesn't come installed with JRuby. And it, we've shied away from trying that because we're unsure of the <coughs> crypto issues um, surrounding packaging a, a crypto library in JRuby and having it downloaded. And so we've been kind of waiting for someone, for a lawyer to step up and clear the fact that we can do that. Um, cues, I mentioned backgrounding. Um, and I think this is something where we really need to have an out-of-the-box solution that says, if you're doing typical uh, messaging with your Rails app, this is what you want to use. There are a number of things out there. There are things like active messaging. There are a number of BJ and DJ and uh, delayed job, uh, job queues and things like that. Um, but I'd like to see one or two um, standard solutions pop up that we can kind of bless and say, 
try this first, and if it doesn't suit your needs, then you can go on from there. Um, out of curiosity, did you notice this, this pickle monster on that sign? I don't know why. He's, <laughs> like, looks like he's about to go eat that, that poor family queuing up for the, for the Tower Bridge there. Um, okay, so I'm running a well, I'm going to run a little bit over. I wanted to show you this quick demo of something that I have here, and I'll breeze through the rest of the, rest of the slides. So one thing I've had in JRuby React for a while is JMS support. And um, I've got a, a, an app wired up here, and I'll just show you what's going on. So we, I have an initializer. Um, I actually load a couple of jar files into the, the JRuby process. You can see that here. And um, basically, those are the JRuby rack jar and an active MQ jar. And then I have requiring a couple of uh, Ruby libraries that JRuby rack uh, has bundled in. And then I'm just going to set up an active MQ, uh, configure an active MQ instance. And by default, what this does is it, it sets up uh, the con it sets up some state inside the Java virtual machine so that you can use JMS. And by default, it uses an in-memory active Q, active MQ server. Um, then I wired up a little queue controller, and I have a couple of little class methods that I inject into um, action, control action controller. So you can say that your controller <coughs> acts as a subscriber or a publisher, and in this case, I'm doing both. And then I just have a simple index me method where I, when the index method is hit with a get, I publish, some, publish a message. And then uh, this little thing, G, do you know G? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like P. <laughs> so, I'll just um, I'll just hit uh, the I'll just hit the Q controller with curl. There you go. Hey. Okay, so that's a simple example that I, I'd worked on for a little while, but never really got a chance to fully play with. There are actually, I think there are actually a couple of guys in the, in the community that are using this particular support, um, and I haven't gotten full feedback from them yet, but this is, this is the kind of thing where I think um, running with something like ActiveMQ is certainly not, not a solution for everyone's problems, but I think it's a good starting point, especially if you're doing development. It's really nice to have that queuing server running in memory, and then ActiveMQ may not be the most stable, most scalable, messaging server, but you can take it out of process and kind of move, move from there. And if, uh, we, I think we need to get to the point where we realize that, you know, we're not all running a, um, websites like Facebook and Twitter and, and, you know, maybe someday you will, but right now you're not. And if these, these uh, lesser grade messaging queues are good enough for you, why not use them right now? And if we can make them available in a way that's make really easy to use, that's even better. So. The, so the remainder of this is talking about sneaking rails in the back door. And what I want to propose to you is, as you go forward and as you look for, for new gigs and you uh, maybe work with clients that have Java environments that you want to try to use Ruby and Rails, so you start, start to think about proposing to them that um, you try Rails alongside your existing systems. So what would it look like to have an app that has Rails running inside next to Struts or Redwork or Spring or, e or an existing servlet app with EJBs and JSPs? Or does a Google Web Toolkit app with, with Rails in it make any sense at all? Maybe not. And what about Grails? I mean, that seems, maybe that just seems like a bad idea. Um, <laughs> but th I think if you saw, if you saw the uh, talk yesterday, if you saw Aaron's talk yesterday, he, he presented the idea of embedding a PHP runtime inside of Ruby, which is, which is preposterous, right? But I think I like the idea from the standpoint of, uh, Sometimes we need to look to other technologies and look for uncommon ways of putting, putting things together, putting tools together as a way of learning about what we could do better. So um, we can go over to Grails and these other Java web frameworks that are, that are getting some mind share and look at what they're doing and see if there's something that we can steal to. So the, the uh, idea I want to start to run with uh, going forward is the idea of actually having a JRuby on Rails stack. Um, and what this means exactly, I don't know for sure. We don't have a, an organization built up around this yet, but I want to start to think about, like I said, having sort of go-to components that are part of, part of the JRuby on Rails experience that people can just rely on, that help people um, build JRuby on Rails apps, um, build them in Java environments, and, and be successful and make it easy to get going. So um, at the base of that stack, of course, is Rails 3. And so 
as you know, a lot of you know, maybe you've probably been reading about Rails 3. The basic idea is to take the existing um, MVC architecture of Rails, pre-Rails 3, and split it up a bit. So you put some walls between the actual controller uh, views and models, make it so they don't, they're not directly coupled to each other, but instead they're coupled through these vertical APIs that are very thin, that are being uh, built on top of, of those components. So now we have active model, we have abstract controller, we have the notion of a view context, and we can, um, we can basically take those those thin layers, and we can start to write new, um, uh, new, new wrappers for new backends for those things, and we can play around with them. So I'd like to propose the idea of having wrappers for Hibernate, for JPA. There's a, there's a neat uh, graph database out there that's written in pure Java called Neo4j. So if you're looking for something non-standard, uh, there's actually a, a guy, uh, Andreas Ronge, who's who's got a, a, a Ruby-based wrapper on that to, that's already ready to go, that's just waiting to be integrated into active model. Um, as far as views go, it might seem like a bastard child, but what about velocity? What about JSP? What about using Java tag lives inside of your Rails views? Yes, it sounds horrible and sounds awful, but this is going to be the reality of, 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 a, of, the, of, the, of the Java world, so why not embrace it? And as far as rack middleware, we want to have uh, easily available rack middleware for things like Hibernate sections, database transactions, Maybe some of the, uh, a way to implement servlet filters inside of Rack might be kind of interesting. So, um, sort of a call to arms for one component would be Hibernate. I think putting Hibernate behind Active Model is is a really good idea. So, for example, here's the list of databases we support in Active Record JDBC. Here's a list of databases that Hibernate uh, purports to support. And <coughs> I don't know about you, but I I maintain the Active Record JDBC library. I'd much rather. Uh, get Hibernate working if it means that I can just assume that all these work and I don't have to do anything else. So the idea with Hibernate for me is that you'd get all this database support, you'd get a rock solid ORM. Um, if we can fit it under act active model, it means we can make it look just like Active Record Access does today. And maybe we can even build it with the goal of being able to work with existing Hibernate models that are already written in Java. So you don't even have to think about um, treating those any differently from any other, any other uh, active model like object in your system. So queues messaging, I mentioned this before, but it'd be nice to have JMS and AMQP wrappers um, built in. I guess Rails itself doesn't really have a standard API for this sort of thing, but maybe that's the direction the community needs to move <coughs> in. Uh, no SQL stores, I think this is an inter interesting area, of course. Um, I mentioned Neo4j already, there's a link there. Um, Terracotta is another interesting technology that Fabio Kung wrote a, a, an interesting demo for, but that's fallen fallen out of um, repair for now, but we need to get some of these ideas going and exp explore those as well. Scheduling, there's a, there's a pretty, pretty solid Java library called Quartz, which allows you to do cron-like scheduling amongst, uh, amongst other things, and you could do it in process. Um, I think scheduling is also a pretty typical component of Rails applications. Um, some enterprises will work better knowing that their scheduling can happen inside their app alongside all their other code rather than having to maintain cron tabs and other sorts of things. SOAP, I don't know if anybody does SOAP anymore. I personally don't like the idea of having to build SOAP, but I know, for example, that uh, the JBoss guys have built SOAP into their TorqueBox platform, and sometimes you're just gonna have to deal with it in an enterprise situation, so I don't know if that's something we need to build or not. And then legacy stuff, I kind of hinted at that earlier. That's probably something that we need to look at. Um, another call for documentation. So, as soon as, so say we actually get some of these stack pieces built, let's get some unified guides and manuals and screencasts around how to use this stuff so we can get people going. So going forward, I want you to think about embracing your inner Java. <laughs> it's really not so bad. Don't think of the enterprise as a big Rube Goldberg machine with lots of uh, sensitive, um, <coughs> fragile bits kind of stringed together with, with mailing wire and duct tape, but instead think about it as a system with um, components that are meant to fit together well. And now the reality is you say, well, most enterprises don't have a, a nice interlocking system, but I'd like to th give you another concept to think about, and that's the idea of Watabi, which is the Japanese um, sort of philosophy about um, uh, embracing simplicity, but also being comfortable uh, with the idea that things aren't perfect. And so you, you're gonna go into these enterprises, but Ruby, the, the great thing about Ruby comes from Japan, so Ruby is Wabi Sabi. I think JRuby is Wabi Sabi, Rails is Wabi Sabi. Take, those, take these things and bring them into the enterprise, but then also don't freak out when you, when you see these 
legacy systems and just try to find a way to make it all live in harmony. So of course your feedback is appreciated. Um, if you have any ideas or are inspired by any of the things that I talked about, love to hear about them. And that's all I have for today. Thanks.